Section number four of a general view of positivism. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A general view of positivism by Auguste Con, translated by John Henry Bridges. Chapter one: The intellectual character of positivism. Part four: We see from these brief remarks that the series of abstract sciences naturally arranges itself according to the decrease in generality and the increase in complication. We see the reason for the introduction of each member of the series and the mutual connection between them. The classification is evidently the same as that before laid down in my theory of development. That theory may therefore be regarded from a statical point of view as furnishing a direct basis for the coordination of abstract conception, on which, as we have seen, the whole synthesis of human life depends. That coordination at once establishes unity in our intellectual operations. It realises the desire, obscurely expressed by Bacon for La Scala Intellectuis, a ladder of the understanding, by the aid of which our thoughts may pass with ease from the lowest subjects to the highest, or vice versa, without weakening the sense of their continuous connection in nature. Each of the six terms, of which our series is composed in its central portion, quite distinct from the two adjoining links, but it is closely related in its commencement to the preceding term, in its conclusion to the term which follows. A further proof of the homogeneousness and continuity of the system is that the same principle of classification, when applied more closely, enables us to arrange the various theories of which each science consists. For example, the three great orders of mathematical speculation, arithmetic, geometry and mechanics, follow the same law of classification as that by which the entire scale is regulated. And as I have shown in my positive philosophy, the same holds good of the other sciences. As a whole, therefore, the series is the most concise summary that can be formed of the vast range of abstract truth, and conversely, all the rational researches of a special kind result in some partial development of the series. Each term in it requires its own special processes of induction, yet in each we reason deductively from the preceding term, a method which will always be as necessary for the purposes of instruction as it was originally for the purposes of delivery. Thus it is that all our other studies are but a preparation for the final science of humanity. By it their mode of culture, which is so closely connected with social sympathy. Nor is there any danger of such influence becoming oppressive, since the very principle of our system is to combine a due measure of independence with practical convergence. The fact that our theory of classification, by the very terms of its competition, composition, subordinates intellectual to social considerations, is eminently calculated to secure its popular acceptance. It brings the whole speculative system under the criticism, and at the same time under the protection of the public, which is usually not slow to check any abuse of those habits of abstraction which are necessary to the philosopher. The same theory, then, which explains the mental evolution of humanity, lays down the true method by which our abstract conception should be classified, thus reconciling the conditions of order and movement hitherto more or less at variance. Its historical clearness and the philosophical force strengthens each other. For we cannot understand the connection of our conceptions except by studying the succession of the phases through which they pass. And, on the other hand, but for the existence of such a connection, it would be impossible to explain the historical phases. So we see that for all sound thinkers, histor history and philosophy are inseparable. Therefore, we are in a position to proceed at once with the work of social regeneration. A theory which embraces the statical as well as the dynamical aspects of the subject, and which fulfils the conditions here spoken of, may certainly regard, be regarded as establishing the true objective basis on which unity can be established in our intellectual functions. And this unity will be developed and consolidated as our knowledge of its basis becomes more satisfactory. But the social application of the system will have far more influence on the result than any overstrained attempts at exact scientific accuracy. The object of our philosophy is to direct the spiritual reorganization of the civilized world, it is with a view to this object that all attempts at fresh, fresh discovery or at improved arrangements should be conducted. Moral and political requirements will lead us to investigate new relations, but the search should not be carried out farther than it is necessary for their application. Sufficient for our purpose, if this incipient classification of our mental products be so far worked out that the synthesis of affection and of action may at once be attempted, that is, 
that we may once begin to construct that system of morality under which the final regeneration of humanity will proceed. Those who have read my positive philosophy will, I think, be convinced that the time for this attempt has arrived. How urgently it is needed will appear in every part of the present work. Error of identifying positivism with atheism, materialism, fatalism or optimism. Atheism, like theology, discusses insoluble mysteries. I have now described the general spirit of positivism, but there are two or three points on which some further explanation is necessary, as they are the source of misapprehensions too common and too serious to be disregarded. Of course I only concern myself with such objections as are made in good faith. The fact of entire freedom from theological belief being necessary before the positive state can be perfectly attained has induced superficial observers to confound positivism with a state of pure negation. Now this state was, at one time, and that even so recently as in the last century, favourable to progress, but at present, in those who unfortunately still remain in it, it is a radical obstacle to all sound, social and even intellectual organisation. I have long ago repudiated all philosophical or historical connection between positivism and what is called atheism, but it is desirable to expose the error somewhat more clearly. Atheism, even from the intellectual point of view, is a very imperfect form of emancipation, for its tendency is to prolong the metaphysical stage indefinitely by to continuing to seek for new solutions of theological problems, instead of setting aside all inaccessible researches on the ground of their utter inutility. The true positive spirit consists in substituting the study of the invariable laws of phenomena for their so-called causes, whether proximate or primary, in a word in studying the how instead of the why. Now, this is wholly incompatible with the ambitious and visionary attempts of atheism to explain the formation of the universe, the origin of animal life, etc. The positivist, comparing the various phases of human speculation, looks upon these scientific chimeras as far less valuable, even from the intellectual point of view, than the first spontaneous inspirations of primeval times. The principle of theology is to explain everything by supernatural wills, that principle can never be set aside until we acknowledge the search for causes to be beyond our reach and limit ourselves to the knowledge of laws. As long as men persist in attempting to answer the insoluble questions which occupy the attention of the childhood of our race, by far the more rational plan is to do as was done then, that is simply to give free play to the imagination. These spontaneous beliefs have gradually fallen into disuse not because they have been disproved, but because mankind has become more enlightened as to its wants and the scope of its powers, and has gradually given an entirely new direction to its speculative efforts. If we insist on penetrating the unattainable mystery of the essential cause that produces phenomena, there is no hypothesis more satisfactory than they proceed from wills dwelling within them or outside them, a hypothesis which assimilates them into the effect produced by the desires which exist within ourselves. Were it not for the pride induced by metaphysical and scientific studies, it would be inconceivable that any atheist, modern or ancient, should have believed that this vague hypothesis on such a subject were preferable to this direct mode of explanation. And it was the only mode which really satisfied the reason until men began to see the utter inanity and inutility of all such search for absolute truth. The order of nature is doubtless very imperfect in every respect, but its production is far more compatible with the hypothesis of, an, hypothesis of an intelligent will than that of a blind mechanism. Persistent atheists, therefore, would seem to be the most illogical of theologists because they occupy themselves with the theological problems and yet reject the only appropriate method of handling them. But the fact that pure atheism, even in the present day, is very rare. is What is called atheism is usually a phase of pantheism, which is really nothing but a relapse disguised under the learned terms, into a vague and abstract form of fetishism. And it is not impossible that it may lead to the reproduction, one form or other, of every theological phase, as soon as the check which modern society still imposes on metaphysical in extravagance has become somewhat weakened. The adoption of such theories as a satisfactory system of belief indicates a very exaggerated or rather false view of intellectual requirements and a very insufficient recognition of moral and social wants. It is generally connected with the visionary but mischievous tendencies of ambitious thinkers to uphold what they call the empires of reason. In the moral sphere it forms a sort of basis for the degrading fallacies of modern metaphysics as to absolute preponderance of self-interest. Politically, 
its tendency is to unlimited prolongation of the revolutionary position. Its spirit is that of blind hatred to the past, and it resists all attempts to explain it on positive principles with a view to disclosing the future. Atheism, therefore, is not likely to lead to positivism, except in those who pass through it rapidly as the last and most short-lived of meta metaphysical phases. And the wide diffusion of the scientific spirit in the present day makes this passage so easy to arrive at maturity without accomplishing it, it is a symptom of certain mental weakness which is often connected with moral insufficiency, and is very incompatible with positivism. Negation offers but a feeble and precarious basis for union, and disbelief in monotheism is of itself no better proof of a mind fit to grapple with the questions of the day than disbelief in polytheism or fetishism which no one would maintain to be an adequate ground for claiming, claiming intellectual sympathy. The atheistic phase, indeed, was not really necessary, except for the revolutions in the last century, who took the lead in the movement towards radical regeneration of society. The necessity has already ceased, for the decayed condition of the old system makes the need for regeneration palpable to all. Persistence in anarchy and atheism are the most characteristic symptom of anarchy, is a temper of mind more unfavourable to the organic spirit, which ought by this time to have established its influence, than sincere adhesion to the old forms. This latter is, of course, obstructive, but at least it does not hinder us from fixing our attention upon the great social problem. Indeed, it helps us to do so, because it forces the new philosophy to throw aside every weapon of attack against the older faith, except in its own higher capacity of satisfying our moral and social wants. But in the atheism maintained by many metaphysicians and scientific men of the present day, positivism, instead of wholesome rivalry of this kind, will meet with nothing but barren resistance. Anti-theological as such men may be, they feel unmixed repugnance for any attempts at social regeneration, although their efforts in the last century had to some extent prepared the way for it. Far then from counting upon their support, positivists must expect to find them hostile although from the incoherence of their opinions it will not be difficult to reclaim those of them whose errors are not essentially due to pride. Materialism is due to the encroachment of the lower sciences on the domain of the higher, an error which positivism rectifies. The charge of materialism which is often made against positive philosophy is of more importance. It originates in the course of scientific study upon which the positive system is based. In answering the charge I need not enter into any discussion of impenetrable mysteries, our theory of development will enable us to see distinctly the real ground and the confusion that exists upon that subject. Positive science was for a long time limited to the simplest subjects. It could not reach the highest except by a natural series of intermediate stages. As each of these steps is taken, the student is apt to be influenced too strongly by the methods and results of the preceding stage. Here, as it seems to me, lies the real source of that scientific error which men have instinctively blamed as materialism. The name is just because the tendency indicated is one which degrades the highest subjects of thought by confounding them with the lower. It was hardly possible that this usurpation by one science of the domain of another should have been wholly avoided. For since the more special phenomena do really depend on the more general, it is perfectly legitimate for each science to exercise a certain deductive influence upon that which follows it in the scale. By such influence, the special induction of that science were rendered more coherent. The result, however, is that each of the sciences has, to, uh, has had to undergo a long struggle against the encroachments of the one preceding it. A struggle which, even in the case of the subjects which have been studied longest, is not yet over. Nor can it entirely cease until the controlling influence of sound philosophy be established over the whole scale, introducing juster views of the relations of its several parts, about which at present there is such irrational confusion. Thus it appears that materialism is a danger inherent in the mode in which the scientific studies is necessary as a preparation for positivism and is pursued. Each science tended to absorb the one next to it on the grounds of having reached the positive stage earlier and more thoroughly. The evil then is really deeper and more extensive than is imagined by most of those who deplore it. It passes generally unnoticed except in the highest class of subjects. These doubtless are more seriously affected inasmuch as they undergo the encroaching process from all the rest, but we find the same thing in different degrees in every step of the scientific scale. Even the lowest step mathematics is no exception, though its position would seem at first sight to exempt it. 
to a philosophic eye there is materialism in the common tendency of mathematics at the present day to absorb geometry or mechanics into the calculus as well as the more evident encroachments of mathematics upon physics of physics upon chemistry of chemistry which is more frequent upon biology or lastly the common tendency of the best biologists to look upon sociology as a mere corollary of their own science in all cases it is the same fundamental error that is an exaggerated use of deductive reasoning and in all it is attended with the same result that higher studies are in constant danger of being disorganized by the indiscriminate application of the lower all scientific specialists at the present time are more or less materialists according as the phenomena studied by them are more or less simple and general geometricians therefore are more liable to error than any others they all aim consciously or otherwise at a synthesis in which the most elementary studies those of number space and motion are made to regulate all the rest but the biologists who resist this encouragement are most energetically are often guilty of the same mistake they not infrequently attempt for instance to explain all sociological facts by the influence of climate and race which are purely secondary thus showing their ignorance of the fundamental laws of sociology which can ever only be discovered by a series of direct inductions from history the philosophical estimate of materialism explains how it is that it has been brought as a charge against positivism and at the same time proves the deep injustice of the charge positivism far from countenancing so dangerous an error is as we have seen the only philosophy which can completely remove it the error arises from certain tendencies which are in themselves legitimate but which have been carried too far and positivism satisfies these tendencies in their due measure hitherto the evil has remained unchecked except by the theologico metaphysical spirit which by giving rise to what is called spiritualism has rendered a very valuable service but useful as it has been it could not arrest an active growth of materialism which has assumed in the eye of modern thinkers something of a progressive character from having been so long connected with the cause of resistance to the retrograde system notwithstanding all these protests of the spiritualists the lower sciences have encroached upon the higher to an extent that seriously impairs their independence and their value but positivism meets the difficulty far more effectively it satisfies and reconciles all that is really tenable in the rival claims of both materialism and spiritualism and having done this it discards them both it holds the one to be as dangerous to order as the others to progress the result is an immediate consequence of the establishment of the encyclopedic scale in which each science retains its own proper sphere of induction while deductively it remains subordinate to the science which precedes it but what really decides the matter is the fact that such paramount importance both logically and scientifically is given by positive philosophy to social questions for these are the questions in which the influence of materialism is most mischievous and also in which it is most easily introduced a system therefore which gives them the precedence over all other questions must hold materialism to be quite as obstructive as spiritualism since both are alike an obstacle to the progress of that science for the sake of which all other sciences are studied further advance in the work of social regeneration implies the elimination of both of them because it cannot proceed without exact knowledge of the laws of moral and social phenomena in the next cha chapter i shall have to speak of these mischievous efforts of materialism upon the art or practice of social life it leads to a misconception of the most fundamental principle that art namely the systematic separation of spiritual over temporal power to maintain that separation to carry out a more satisfactory basis the admirable attempt made in the middle ages by the catholic church is the most important of political questions thus the antagonism of positivism to materialism rests upon political no less than upon philosophical grounds with the view of se securing a dispassionate consideration of this subject and of avoiding all confusion i have laid no stress upon the charge of immorality that is so often brought against materialism the reproach even when made sincerely is constantly belied by experience indeed it is inconsistent with all that we know of human nature our opinions whether right or wrong have not fortunately had the absolute power over our feelings and conduct which is commonly attributed to them materialism has been provisionally connected with the whole movement of emancipations and has therefore often been found in common with the noblest aspirations that connection however has now ceased and it must be owned that even in the most favourable cases this error purely intellectual though it be has to a certain extent always checked the free play of our nobler instincts by leading men to ignore or misconceive moral phenomena which were left unexplained by its crude hypothesis cabanes gave a striking example of this tendency in its unfortunate attack against medieval chivalry 
Cabinus was a philosopher whose moral nature was as pure and sympathetic as his intellect was elevated and enlarged. Yet the materialism of his day had entirely blinded him to the beneficial results of the attempts made by the most energetic of our ancestors to the institute of the worship of woman. We have now examined the two principal charges brought against the positive system, and have found that they apply merely to the unsystematic state in which positivist principles were first introduced. But the system is also accused of fatalism and optimism, charges which it will not ne be necessary to dwell on at great length, because, though frequently made, they are not difficult to refute. Nor is positivism fatalist, since it exerts the external order to be modifiable. The charge of fatalism has accompanied every fresh extension of positive science from its first beginning. Nor is this surprising, for when any series of phenomena passes from the domain of wills, whether it m be modified by metaphysical abstractions or not, to the dominion of laws, the regularity of the latter contrasts so strongly with the instability of the former as to present the appearance of fatality, which nothing but a very careful examination of the real character of scientific truth can dissipate. And this error is the more likely to occur from the fact that our first types of natural laws are derived from the phenomena of the heavenly bodies. These being wholly beyond our interference always suggest the notion of absolute necessity a notion of which it is difficult to prevent from extending to more complex phenomena as soon as they are brought within the reach of a positive method. And it is quite true that positivism, positivism holds the order of nature to be in its primary aspects strictly invariable. All variations, whether spontaneous or artificial, are, the only are only transient or of secondary import. The conception of unlimited variations would, in fact, be very equivalent to the rejection of the law altogether. But while this accounts for the fact that every new positive theory is accused of fatalism, it is equally clear that blind persistence in the accusation shows a very shallow conception of what positivism really is. For, unchangeable as the order of nature is in its main aspects, yet all its phenomena, except those of astronomy, admit of being modified in their secondary relations. And this is the more that they are more complicated. The positivist spirit, when confined to the subjects of mathematics and astronomy, was inevitably fatalist but this ceased to be the case when it extended to physics and chemistry, and especially to biology, where the margin of variation is very considerable. Now that it embraces social phenomena, the reproach, however it may have been once deserved, should be heard no longer, since these phenomena, which will for the future form a principal field, admit of larger modification than of any others, and chiefly by our own intervention. It is obvious then that positivism, far from encouraging indolence, stimulates the action, especially to social action, far more energetically than any theological doctrine. It removes all groundless scruples and prevents us from having recourse to chimeras. It encourages our efforts everywhere, except where they are manifestly useless. The charge of optimism applies to theology rather than positivism. The positivist judges of all historical actions relatively, but does not justify them indiscriminately. For the charge of optimism, there is even less ground for, than for that of fatalism. The latter was to a certain extent, connected with the rise of the positivist spirit. But optimism is simply a result of theology, and its influence has always been decreasing with the growth of positivism. Astronomical laws, it is true, suggest the idea of perfection as naturally as that of necessity. On the other hand, their great simplicity places the defects of the order of nature in so clear a light that optimists would never have sought their arguments in astronomy, were it not that the first elements of that science had to be worked out under the influence of monotheism, a system which involved the hypothesis of absolute wisdom. But, by the theory of development on which the positive synthesis is here made to rest, optimism is discarded, as well as fatalism, in the direct proportion of the intricacy of the, intricacy of the phenomena. It is in the most intricate that the defects of nature, as well as the power of modifying them, become manifest. With regard, therefore, to social phenomena, the most complex of all, both charges are utterly misplaced. Any optimistic tendencies that writers on social subjects may display must be due to the fact that their education has not been such as to teach them the nature and conditions of the true scientific spirit. For want of sound logical training, great misuse has been made in our own time of a property peculiar to social phenomena. It is that we find them in greater amount spontaneous wisdom than might have been expected from their complexity. It would be a mistake, however, to suppose this wisdom perfect. The phenomena in question are those of intelligent beings who are always occupied in amending the defects of their economy. It is obvious, therefore, that they will show less imperfection than if, as in a case equally complicated, 
the agents could have been blind. The standard by which to judge of action will always be taken relatively in the social state in which the action takes place. Therefore all historical positions and changes must have at least some grounds of justification, otherwise they would be totally incomprehensible. Because inconsistent with the nature of the agents and of the actions performed by them. Now this naturally fosters a dangerous tendency to optimism in all thinkers, who, whatever their powers may be, have not passed through any strict scientific training, and have consequently never cast off any metaphysical and theological modes of thought in the higher subjects. Because every government shows a certain adaptation to the civilization of its time, they make the loose assertion that the adaptation is perfect, a conception which is of course chimerical. But it is unjust to charge positivism with errors which are evidently contrary to its true spirit, and merely due to the want of logical and scientific training of those who have hitherto engaged in the study of social questions. The object of sociology is to explain all historical facts, not to justify them indiscriminately, as is done by those who are unable to distinguish the influence of the agent from that of its surrounding circumstances. The word positive connotes all the highest intellectual attributes and will ultimately have a moral significance. On reviewing this brief sketch of the intellectual character of positivism, it will be seen that all its essential attributes are summed up in the word positive, which I applied to the new philosophy at its outset. All the languages of Western Europe agree in understanding by this word and its derivatives the two qualities of reality and usefulness. Combining these, we at once get an adequate definition of the true philosophic spirit, which after all is nothing but good sense generalised and put into a systematic form. The term also implies, in all European languages, certainty and precision, qualities by which the intellect of modern nations is markedly distinguished from those of antiquity. Again, the ordinary acceptance of the term implies a directly organic tendency. Now, the metaphysical spirit is incapable of organising, it can only criticise. This distinguishes it from the positive spirit, although for a time they had a common sphere of action. By speaking of positivism as organic, we imply that it has social purpose, that purpose being to supersede theology in the spiritual direction of the human race. But the word will bear yet a further meaning. The organic character of the system leads us naturally to another of its attributes, namely its invariable relativity. Modern thinkers will never rise above that critical position which they have hitherto taken up towards the past, except by repudiating all absolute principles. This last meaning is more latent than the others, but it is really contained in the term. It will soon become generally accepted, and the word positive will be understood to mean relative as much as it now means organic, precise, certain, useful and real. Thus the highest attributes of human wisdom we have, with one exception, have been gradually condensed into a single expressive term. All that is now wanting is that the word should denote what at first could form no part of the meaning, the union of moral with intellectual qualities. At present only the latter are included, but the course of modern progress makes it certain that the conception applied by the word positive will ultimately have a more direct reference to the heart than to the understanding. For it will soon be felt by all that the tendency of positivism, and that by virtue of its primary characteristic reality, is to make feeling systematically supreme over reason as well as over activity. After all, the change consists in simply realising the full etymological value of the word philosophy, for it was impossible to realise it until moral and mental conditions have been reconciled, and this has now been done by the foundation of a positive science of society. End of section 4, recorded by Morris in Alty, Bedfordshire. Section 5 of A General View of Positivism. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Oxnard. A General View of Positivism by Auguste Comte. Translated by John Henry Bridges. Chapter 2. The Social Aspect of Positivism as shown by its connection with the general revolutionary movement of Western Europe, Part 1. As the chief characteristic of positive philosophy is the paramount importance that is given, and that on speculative grounds, to social considerations, its efficiency for the purposes of practical life is involved in the very spirit of the system. When this spirit is rightly understood, we find that it leads at once to an object far higher than that of satisfying our scientific curiosity, the object, namely, of organising human life. 
conversely this practical aspect of positive philosophy exercises the most salutary influence upon its speculative character by keeping constantly before us the necessity of concentrating all scientific efforts upon the social object which constitutes their value we take the best possible means of checking the tendency inherent in all abstract inquiries to degenerate into useless digressions but this general connection between theory and practice would not by itself be sufficient for our purpose it would be impossible to secure the acceptance of a mental discipline so new and so difficult were it not for considerations derived from the general conditions of modern society considerations calculated to impress philosophers with a more definite sense of obligation to do their utmost towards satisfying the wants of the time by thus arousing public sympathies and showing that the success of positivism is a matter of permanent and general importance the coherence of the system as well as the elevation of its aims will be placed beyond dispute we have hitherto been regarding positivism as the issue in which intellectual development necessarily results we have now to view it from the social side for until we have done this it is impossible to form a true conception of it and to do this all that is here necessary is to point out the close relation in which the new philosophy stands to the whole course of the french revolution this revolution has now been agitating western nations for sixty years it is the final issue of the vast transition through which we have been passing during the five previous centuries in this great crisis there are naturally two principal phases of which only the first or negative phase has yet been accomplished in it we gave the last blow to the old system but without arriving at any fixed and distinct prospect of the new in the second or positive phase which is at last beginning a basis for the new social state has to be constructed the first phase led as its ultimate result to the formation of a sound philosophical system and by this system the second phase will be directed it is this twofold connection which we are now to consider the strong reaction which was exercised upon the intellect by the first great shock of revolution was absolutely necessary to rouse and sustain our mental efforts in the search for a new system for the greatest thinkers of the eighteenth century had been blinded to the true character of the new state by the effete remnants of the old and the shock was especially necessary for the foundation of social science for the basis of that science is the conception of human progress a conception which nothing but the revolution could have brought forward into sufficient prominence social order was regarded by the ancients as stationary and its theory under this provisional aspect was admirably sketched out by the great aristotle in this respect the case of sociology resembles that of biology in biology statical conceptions were attained without the least knowledge of dynamical laws similarly the social speculations of antiquity are entirely devoid of the conception of progress their historical field was too narrow to indicate any continuous movement of humanity it was not till the middle ages that this movement became sufficiently manifest to inspire the feeling that we were tending towards a state of increased perfection it was then seen by all that catholicism was superior to polytheism and judaism and this was afterwards confirmed by the corresponding political improvement produced by the substitution of feudalism for roman government confused as this first feeling of human progress was it was yet very intense and very largely diffused though it lost much of its vitality in the theological and metaphysical discussions of later centuries it is here that we must look if we would understand that ardour in the cause of progress which is peculiar to the western family of nations and which has been strong enough to check many sophistical delusions especially in the countries where the noble aspirations of the middle ages have been least impaired by the metaphysical theories of protestantism or deism but whatever the importance of this nascent feeling it was very far from sufficient to establish the conviction of progress as a fundamental principle of human society to demonstrate any kind of progression at least three terms are requisite now the absolute character of theological philosophy by which the comparison between polytheism and catholicism was instituted 
prevented men from conceiving the bare possibility of any further stage the limits of perfection were supposed to have been reached by the medieval system and beyond it there was nothing but the christian utopia of a future life the decline of medieval theology soon set the imagination free from any such obstacles but it led at the same time to a mental reaction which for a long time was unfavourable to the development of this first conception of progress he brought a feeling of blind antipathy to the middle ages almost all thinkers in their dislike of the catholic dogmas were seized with such a rational admiration for antiquity as entirely to ignore the social superiority of the medieval system and it was only among the untaught masses especially in the countries preserved from protestantism that any real feeling of this superiority was retained it was not till the middle of the seventeenth century that modern thinkers began to dwell on the conception of progress it reappeared then under a new aspect conclusive evidence had by that time been furnished that the more civilized portion of our race had advanced in science and industry and even though not so unquestionably in the fine arts but these aspects were only partial and though they were undoubtedly the source of the more systematic views held by our own century upon the subject they were not enough to demonstrate the fact of a progression and indeed from the social point of view so far more important than any other progress seemed more doubtful than it had been in the middle ages but this condition of opinion was changed by the revolutionary shock which impelled france the normal centre of western europe to apply itself to the task of social regeneration a third term of comparison that is to say the type on which the modern society is being moulded now presented itself though it lay as yet in a distant and obscure future compared with the medieval system it was seen to be an advance as great as that which justified our ancestors of chivalrous times in asserting superiority to their predecessors of antiquity until the destruction of catholic feudalism became an overt fact its effete remnants had concealed the political future and the fact of continuous progress in society had always remained uncertain social phenomena have this peculiarity that the object observed undergoes a process of development as well as and simultaneously with the observer now up to the time of the revolution political development on which the principal argument for the theory of progress must always be based corresponded in its imperfection to the incapacity of the scientific spirit to frame the theory of it a century ago thinkers of the greatest eminence were unable to conceive of a really continuous progression and humanity as they thought was destined to move in circles or in oscillations but under the influence of the revolution a real sense of human development has arisen spontaneously and with more or less result in minds of the most ordinary caste first in france and subsequently throughout the whole of western europe in this respect the crisis has been most salutary it has given us that mental courage as well as force without which the conception could never have arisen it is the basis of social science and therefore of all positive philosophy since it is only from the social aspect that positive philosophy admits of being viewed as a connected whole without the theory of progress the theory of order even supposing that it could be formed would be inadequate as a basis for sociology it is essential that the two should be combined the very fact that progress however viewed is nothing but the development of order shows that order cannot be fully manifested without progress the dependence of positivism upon the french revolution may now be understood more clearly nor was it by a merely fortuitous coincidence that by this time the introductory course of scientific knowledge by which the mind is prepared for positivism should have been sufficiently completed but we must here observe that beneficial as the intellectual reaction of this great crisis undoubtedly was its effects could not be realized until the ardor of the revolutionary spirit had been to some extent weakened the dazzling light thrown upon the future for some time obscured our vision of the past it disclosed though obscurely the third term of the social progression but it prevented us from fairly appreciating the second term it encouraged that blind aversion to the middle ages which had been inspired by the emancipating process of modern times a feeling which had once been necessary to induce us to abandon the old system 
the suppression of this intermediate step would be as fatal to the conception of progress as the absence of the last because this last differs too widely from the first to admit of any direct comparison with it right views upon the subject were impossible therefore until full justice had been rendered to the middle ages which form at once the point of union and of separation between ancient and modern history now it was quite impossible to do this as long as the excitement of the first years of the revolution lasted in this respect the philosophical reaction organized at the beginning of our century by the great de maistre was of material assistance in preparing the true theory of progress his school was of brief duration and it was no doubt animated by a retrograde spirit but it will always be ranked among the necessary antecedents of the positive system although its works are now entirely superseded by the rise of the new philosophy which in a more perfect form has embodied all their chief results what was required therefore for the discovery of sociological laws and for the establishment upon these laws of a sound philosophical system was an intellect in the vigour of youth imbued with all the ardour of the revolutionary spirit and yet spontaneously assimilating all that was valuable in the attempts of the retrograde school to appreciate the historical importance of the middle ages in this way and in no other could the true spirit of history arise for that spirit consists in the sense of human continuity which had hitherto been felt by no one not even by my illustrious and unfortunate predecessor condorcet meantime the genius of gaul was completing the recent attempts to systematize biology by commencing the study of the internal functions of the brain as far at least as these could be understood from the phenomena of individual as distinct from social development and now i have explained the series of social and intellectual conditions by which the discovery of sociological laws and consequently the foundation of positivism was fixed for the precise date at which i began my philosophical career that is to say one generation after the progressive dictatorship of the convention and almost immediately after the fall of the retrograde tyranny of bonaparte thus it appears that the revolutionary movement and the long period of reaction which succeeded it were alike necessary before the new general doctrine could be distinctly conceived of as a whole and if this preparation was needed for the establishment of positivism as a philosophical system far more needful was it for the recognition of its social value for it guaranteed free exposition and discussion of opinion and it led the public to look to positivism as the system which contained in germ the ultimate solution of social problems this is a point so obvious that we need not dwell upon it further having satisfied ourselves of the dependence of positivism upon the first phase of the revolution we have now to consider it as the future guide of the second phase it is often supposed that the destruction of the old regime was brought about by the revolution but history when carefully examined points to a very different conclusion it shows that the revolution was not the cause but the consequence of the utter decomposition of the medieval system a process which had been going on for five centuries throughout western europe and especially in france spontaneously at first and afterwards in a more systematic way the revolution far from protracting the negative movement of previous centuries was a bar to its further extension it was a final outbreak in which men showed their irrevocable purpose of abandoning the old system altogether and of proceeding at once to the task of entire reconstruction the most conclusive proof of this intention was given by the abolition of royalty which had been the rallying point of all the decaying remnants of the old french constitution but with this exception which only occupied the convention during its first sitting the constructive tendencies of the movement were apparent from its outset and they showed themselves still more clearly as soon as the republican spirit had become predominant it is obvious however that strong as these tendencies may have been the first period of the revolution produced results of an extremely negative and destructive kind in fact the movement was in this respect a failure this is partly to be attributed to the pressing necessities of the hard struggle for national independence which france maintained so gloriously against the combined attacks of the retrograde nations of europe 
but it is far more largely owing to the purely critical character of the metaphysical doctrines by which the revolutionary spirit was at that time directed the negative and the positive movements which have been going on in western europe since the close of the middle ages have been of course connected with each other but the former has necessarily advanced with greater rapidity than the latter the old system has so entirely declined that a desire for social regeneration had become general before the groundwork of the new system had been sufficiently completed for its true character to be understood as we have just seen the doctrine by which social regeneration is now to be directed could not have arisen previously to the revolution the impulse which the revolution gave to thought was indispensable to its formation here then was an insurmountable fatality by which men were forced to make use of the critical principles which had been found serviceable in former struggles as the only available instruments of construction as soon as the old order had once been fairly abandoned there was of course no utility whatever in the negative philosophy but its doctrines had become familiar to men's minds and its motto of liberty and equality was at that time the one most compatible with social progress thus the first stage of the revolutionary movement was accomplished under the influence of principles that had become obsolete and that were quite inadequate to the new task required of them for constructive purposes the revolutionary philosophy was valueless except so far as it put forward a vague programme of the political future founded on sentiment rather than conviction and unaccompanied by any explanation of the right mode of realising it in default of organic principles the doctrines of the critical school were employed and the result speedily showed their inherent tendency to anarchy a tendency as perilous to the germs of the new order as to the ruins of the old the experiment was tried once for all and it left such ineffaceable memories that it is not probable that any serious attempt will be made to repeat it the incapacity for construction inherent in the doctrine in which the revolutionary spirit had embodied itself was placed beyond the reach of doubt the result was to impress every one with the urgent necessity for social renovation but the principles of that renovation were still left undetermined in this condition of philosophical and political opinion the necessity of order was felt to be paramount and a long period of reaction ensued dating from the official deism introduced by robespierre it reached its height under the aggressive system of bonaparte and it was feebly protracted in spite of the peace of eighteen fifteen by his insignificant successors the only permanent result of this period was the historical and doctrinal evidence brought forward by de maistre and his school of the social inutility of modern metaphysics while at the same time their intellectual weakness was being proved by the successful attempts of cabanis and still more of gaul to extend the positive method to the highest biological questions in all other respects this elaborate attempt to prevent the final emancipation of humanity proved a complete failure in fact it led to a revival of the instinct of progress strong antipathies were roused everywhere by these fruitless efforts at reconstructing a system which had become so entirely obsolete that even those who were labouring to rebuild it no longer understood its character or the conditions of its existence a reawakening of the revolutionary spirit was thus inevitable and it took place as soon as peace was established and the chief upholder of the retrograde system had been removed the doctrines of negation were called back to life but very little illusion now remained as to their capacity for organizing in want of something better men accepted them as a means of resisting retrograde principles just as these last had owed their apparent success to the necessity of checking the tendency to anarchy amidst these fresh debates on worn-out subjects the public soon became aware that a final solution of the question had not yet arisen even in germ it therefore concerned itself for little except the maintenance of order and liberty conditions as indispensable for the free action of philosophy as for material prosperity the whole position was most favourable for the construction of a definite solution and it was in fact during the last phase of the retrograde movement that the elementary principle of a solution was furnished by my discovery in eighteen twenty two 
of the twofold law of intellectual development the apparent indifference of the public to whom all the existing parties seem equally devoid of insight into the political future was at last mistaken by a blind government for tacit consent to its unwise schemes the cause of progress was in danger then came the memorable crisis of eighteen thirty by which the system of reaction introduced thirty-six years previously was brought to an end the convictions which that system inspired were indeed so superficial that its supporters came of their own accord to disavow them and to uphold in their own fashion the chief revolutionary doctrines these again were abandoned by their previous supporters on their accession to power when the history of these times is written nothing will give a clearer view of the revulsion of feeling on both sides than the debates which took place on liberty of education within a period of twenty years it was alternately demanded and refused by both and this in behalf of the same principles as they were called though it was in reality a question of interest rather than principle on either side all previous convictions being thus thoroughly upset more room was left for the instinctive feeling of the public and the question of reconciling the spirit of order with that of progress now came into prominence it was the most important of all problems and it was now placed in its true light but this only made the absence of a solution more manifest and the principle of the solution existed nowhere but in positivism which as yet was immature all the opinions of the day had become alike utterly incompatible both with order and with progress the conservative school undertook to reconcile the two but it had no constructive power and the only result of its doctrine was to give equal encouragement to anarchy and to reaction so as to be able always to neutralize the one by the other the establishment of constitutional monarchy was now put forward as the ultimate issue of the great revolution but no one could seriously place any real confidence in a system so alien to the whole character of french history offering as it did nothing but a superficial and unwise imitation of a political anomaly essentially peculiar to england the period then between eighteen thirty and eighteen forty eight may be regarded as a natural pause in the political movement the reaction which succeeded the original crisis had exhausted itself but the final or organic phase of the revolution was still delayed for want of definite principles to guide it no conception had been formed of it except by a small number of philosophic minds who had taken their stand upon the recently established laws of social science and had found themselves able without recourse to any chimerical views to gain some general insight into the political future of which condorcet my principal predecessor knew so little but it was impossible for the regenerating doctrine to spread more widely and to be accepted as the peaceful solution of social problems until a distinct refutation had been given of the false assertion so authoritatively made that the parliamentary system was the ultimate issue of the revolution this notion once destroyed the work of spiritual reorganization should be left entirely to the free efforts of independent thinkers in these respects our last political change eighteen forty eight will have accomplished all that is required thanks to the instinctive sense and vigour of our working classes the reactionist leanings of the orleanist government which had become hostile to the purpose for which it was originally instituted have at last brought about the final abolition of monarchy in france the prestige of monarchy had long been lost and it now only impeded progress without being of any real benefit to order by its fictitious supremacy it directly hindered the work of spiritual reformation whilst the measure of real power which it possessed was insufficient to control the wretched political agitation maintained by animosities of a purely personal character viewed negatively the principle of republicanism sums up the first phase of the revolution it precludes the possibility of recurrence to royalism which ever since the second half of the reign of louis the fourteenth has been the rallying point of all reactionist tendencies interpreting the principle in its positive sense we may regard it as a direct step towards the final regeneration of society by consecrating all human forces of whatever kind to the general service of the community republicanism recognizes the doctrine of subordinating politics to morals 
of course it is as a feeling rather than as a principle that this doctrine is at present adopted but it could not obtain acceptance in any other way and even when put forward in a more systematic shape it is upon the aid of feeling that it will principally rely as i have shown in the previous chapter in this respect france has proved worthy of her position as the leader of the great family of western nations and has in reality already entered upon the normal state without the intervention of any theological system she has asserted the true principle on which society should rest a principle which originated in the middle ages under the impulse of catholicism but for the general acceptance of which a sounder philosophy and more suitable circumstances were necessary the direct tendency then of the french republic is to sanction the fundamental principle of positivism the preponderance namely of feeling over intellect and activity starting from this point public opinion will soon be convinced that the work of organizing society on republican principles is one which can only be performed by the new philosophy the whole position brings into fuller prominence the fundamental problem previously proposed of reconciling order and progress the urgent necessity of doing so is acknowledged by all but the utter incapacity of any of the existing schools of opinion to realize it becomes increasingly evident the abolition of monarchy removes the most important obstacle to social progress but at the same time it deprives us of the only remaining guarantee for public order thus the time is doubly favourable to constructive tendencies yet at present there are no opinions which possess more than the purely negative value of checking and that very imperfectly the error opposite to their own in a position which guarantees progress and compromises order it is naturally for the latter that the greatest anxiety is felt and we are still without any organ capable of systematically defending it yet experience should have taught us how extremely fragile every government must be which is purely material that is which is based solely upon self-interest and is destitute of sympathies and convictions on the other hand spiritual order is not to be hoped for at present in the absence of any doctrine which commands general respect even the social instinct is a force on the political value of which we cannot always rely for when not based on some definite principle it not unfrequently becomes source of disturbance hence we are driven back to the continuance of a material system of government although its inadequacy is acknowledged by all in a republic however such a government cannot employ its most efficient instrument corruption it has to resort instead to repressive measures of a more or less transitory kind every time that the danger of anarchy becomes too threatening these occasional measures however naturally proportion themselves to the necessities of the case thus though order is exposed to greater perils than progress it can count on more powerful resources for its defence shortly after the publication of the first edition of this work the extraordinary outbreak of june eighteen forty eight proved that the republic could call into play and indeed could push to excess in the cause of public order forces far greater than those of the monarchy thus royalty no longer possesses that monopoly of preserving order which has hitherto induced a few sincere and thinking men to continue to support it and henceforth the sole political characteristic which it retains is that of obstructing progress and yet by another reaction of this contradictory position of affairs the monarchical party seems at present to have become the organ of resistance in behalf of material order retrograde as its doctrines are yet from their still retaining a certain organic tendency the conservative instincts rally round them to this the progressive instincts offer no serious obstacle their insufficiency for the present needs being more or less distinctly recognized it is not to the monarchical party however that we must look for conservative principles for in this quarter they are wholly abandoned and unhesitating adoption of every revolutionary principle is resorted to as a means of retaining power so that the doctrine of the revolution would seem fated to close their existence in the retrograde camp so urgent is the need of order that we are driven to accept for the moment a party which has lost all its old convictions and which had apparently become extinct before the republic began 
positivism and positivism alone can disentangle and terminate this anomalous position the principle on which it depends is manifestly this as long as progress tends towards anarchy so long will order continue to be retrograde but the retrograde movement never really attains its object indeed its principles are always neutralized by inconsistent concessions judged by the boastful language of its leaders we might imagine that it was destroying republicanism whereas the movement would not exist at all but for the peculiar circumstances in which we are placed circumstances which are forced into greater prominence by the foolish opposition of most of the authorities as soon as the instinct of political improvement has placed itself under systematic guidance its growth will bear down all resistance and then the reason of its present stagnation will be patent to all end of section five Section 6 of A General View of Positivism. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Oxnard. A General View of Positivism by Auguste Comte. Translated by John Henry Bridges. Chapter 2 the social aspect of positivism as shown by its connection with the general revolutionary movement of western europe part two and for this theologism is unawares preparing the way its apparent preponderance places positivism in precisely that position which i wished for ten years ago the two organic principles can now be brought side by side and their relative strength tested without the complication of any metaphysical considerations for the incoherence of metaphysical systems is now recognized and they are finally decaying under the very political system which seemed at one time likely to promote their acceptance construction is seen by all to be the thing wanted and men are rapidly becoming aware of the utter hollowness of all schools which confine themselves to protests against the institutions of theologism while admitting its essential principles so defunct indeed have these schools become that they can no longer fulfil even their old office of destruction this has fallen now as an accessory task upon positivism which offers the only systematic guarantee against retrogression as well as against anarchy psychologists strictly so called have already for the most part disappeared with the fall of constitutional monarchy so close is the relation between these two importations from protestantism it seemed likely therefore that the ideologists their natural rivals would regain their influence with the people but even they cannot win back the confidence reposed in them during the great revolution because the doctrines in virtue of which it was then given are now so utterly exploded the most advanced of their number unworthy successors of the school of voltaire and danton have shown themselves thoroughly incapable either morally or intellectually of directing the second phase of the revolution which they are hardly able to distinguish from the first phase formerly i had taken as their type a man of far superior merit the noble armand carrel whose death was such a grievous loss to the republican cause but he was a complete exception to the general rule true republican convictions were impossible with men who had been schooled in parliamentary intrigues and who had directed or aided the pertinacious efforts of the french press to rehabilitate the name of bonaparte their accession to power was futile for they could only maintain material order by calling in the retrograde party and they soon became mere auxiliaries of this party disgracefully abjuring all their philosophical convictions there is one proceeding which though it is but an episode in the course of events will always remain as a test of the true character of this unnatural alliance i allude to the roman expedition of eighteen forty nine a detestable and contemptible act for which just penalties will speedily be imposed on all who were accessory to it not to speak of the damnatory verdict of history but precisely the same hypocritical opposition to progress has been exhibited by the other class of deists the disciples that is of rousseau who profess to adopt robespierre's policy 
having had no share in the government they have not so entirely lost their hold upon the people but they are at the present time totally devoid of political coherence their wild anarchy is incompatible with the general tone of feeling maintained by the industrial activity the scientific spirit and the aesthetic culture of modern life these professors of the guillotine as they may be called whose superficial sophisms would reduce exceptional outbreaks of popular fury into a cold-blooded system soon found themselves forced for the sake of popularity to sanction the law which very properly abolished capital punishment for political offences in the same way they are now obliged to disown the only real meaning of the red flag which serves to distinguish their party too vague as it is for any other name equally wrong have they shown themselves in interpreting the tendencies of the working classes from being so entirely taken up with questions of abstract rights the people have allowed these rights to be taken from them without a struggle whenever the cause of order had seemed to require it yet they still persist mechanically in maintaining that it is on questions of this sort that the solution of all our difficulties depends taking for their political ideal a short and anomalous period of our history which is never likely to recur they are always attempting to suppress liberty for the sake of what they call progress in a time of unchangeable peace they are the only real supporters of war their conception of the organization of labor is simply to destroy the industrial hierarchy of capitalist and workmen established in the middle ages and in fact in every respect these sophistical anarchists are utterly out of keeping with the century in which they live there are some it is true who still retain a measure of influence with the working classes incapable and unworthy though they be of their position but their credit is rapidly declining and it is not likely to become dangerous at a time when political enthusiasm is no longer to be won by metaphysical prejudices the only effect really produced by this party of disorder is to serve as a bugbear for the benefit of the retrograde party who thus obtain official support from the middle class in a way which is quite contrary to all the principles and habits of that class it is very improbable that these foolish levellers will ever succeed to power should they do so however their reign will be short and will soon result in their final extinction because it will convince the people of their profound incapacity to direct the regeneration of europe the position of affairs therefore is now distinct and clear and it is leading men to withdraw their confidence from all metaphysical schools as they had already withdrawn it from theology in this general discredit of all the old systems the way becomes clear for positivism the only school which harmonizes with the real tendencies as well as with the essential needs of the nineteenth century in this explanation of the recent position of french affairs one point yet remains to be insisted on we have seen from the general course of the philosophical and yet more of the political movement the urgent necessity for a universal doctrine capable of checking erroneous action and of avoiding or moderating popular outbreaks but there is another need equally manifest the need of a spiritual power without which it would be utterly impossible to bring our philosophy to bear upon practical life widely divergent as the various metaphysical sects are there is one point in which they all spontaneously agree that is in repudiating the distinction between temporal and spiritual authority this has been the great revolutionary principle ever since the fourteenth century and more especially since the rise of protestantism it originated in repugnance to the medieval system the so-called philosophers of our time whether psychologists or ideologists have like their greek predecessors always aimed at a complete concentration of all social powers and they have even spread this delusion among the students of special sciences at present there is no appreciation except in the positive system of that instinctive sagacity which led all the great men of the middle ages to institute for the first time the separation of moral from political authority it was a masterpiece of human wisdom but it was premature and could not be permanently successful at a time when men were still governed on theological principles and practical life still retained its military character this separation of powers on which the final organization of society will principally depend is understood and valued nowhere but in the new school of philosophy 
if we accept the unconscious and tacit admiration for it which still exists in the countries from which protestantism has been excluded from the outset of the revolution the pride of theorists has always made them wish to become socially despotic a state of things to which they have ever looked forward as their political ideal public opinion has by this time grown far too enlightened to allow any practical realization of a notion at once so chimerical and so retrograde but public opinion not being as yet sufficiently organized efforts in this direction are constantly being made the longing among metaphysical reformers for practical as well as theoretical supremacy is now greater than ever because from the changed state of affairs their ambition is no longer limited to mere administrative functions their various views diverge so widely and all find so little sympathy in the public that there is not much fear of their ever being able to check free discussion to any serious extent by giving legal sanction to their own particular doctrine but quite enough has been attempted to convince every one how essentially despotic every theory of society must be which opposes this fundamental principle of modern polity the permanent separation of spiritual from temporal power the disturbances caused by the metaphysical ambition corroborate then the view urged so conclusively by the adherents of the new school that this division of powers is equally essential to order and to progress if positive thinkers continue to withstand all temptations to mix actively in politics and go on quietly with their own work amidst the unmeaning agitation around them they will ultimately make the impartial portion of the public familiar with this great conception it will henceforth be judged irrespectively of the religious doctrines with which it was originally connected men will involuntarily contrast it with other systems and will see more and more clearly that positive principles afford the only basis for true freedom as well as for true union they alone can tolerate full discussion because they alone rest upon solid proof men's practical wisdom guided by the peculiar nature of our political position will react strongly upon philosophers and keep them strictly to their sphere of moral and intellectual influence the slightest tendency towards the assumption of political power will be checked and the desire for it will be considered as a certain sign of mental weakness and indeed of moral deficiency now that royalty is abolished all true thinkers are secure of perfect freedom of thought and even of expression as long as they abide by the necessary conditions of public order royalty was the last remnant of the system of castes which gave the monopoly of deciding on important social questions to a special family its abolition completes the process of theological emancipation of course the magistrates of a republic may show despotic tendencies but they can never become very dangerous where power is held on so brief a tenure and where even when concentrated in a single person it emanates from suffrage incompetent as that may be it is easy for the positivist to show that these functionaries know very little more than their constituents of the logical and scientific conditions necessary for the systematic working out of moral and social doctrines such authorities though devoid of any spiritual sanction may however command obedience in the name of order but they can never be really respected unless they adhere scrupulously to their temporal functions without claiming the least authority over thought even before the central power falls into the hands of men really fit to wield it the republican character of our government will have forced this conviction upon a nation that has now got rid of all political fanaticism whether of a retrograde or anarchical kind and the conviction is the more certain to arise because practical authorities will become more and more absorbed in the maintenance of material order and will therefore leave the question of spiritual order to the unrestricted efforts of thinkers it is neither by accident nor by personal influence that i have myself always enjoyed so large a measure of freedom in writing and subsequently in public lectures and this under governments all of which were more or less oppressive every true philosopher will receive the same license if like myself he offers the intellectual and moral guarantees which the public and the civil power are fairly entitled to expect from the systematic organs of humanity the necessity of controlling levellers may lead to occasional acts of unwise violence but i am convinced that respect will always be shown to constructive thinkers and that they will soon be called in to the assistance of public order 
for order will not be able to exist much longer without the sanction of some rational principle the result then of the important political changes which have recently taken place is this the second phase of the revolution which hitherto has been restricted to a few advanced minds is now entered by the public and men are rapidly forming juster views of its true character it is becoming recognized that the only firm basis for a reform of our political institutions is a complete reorganization of opinion and of life and the way is open for the new religious doctrine to direct this work i have thus explained the way in which the social mission of positivism connects itself with the spontaneous changes which are taking place in france the centre of the revolutionary movement but it would be a mistake to suppose that france will be the only scene of these reorganizing efforts judging on sound historical principles we cannot doubt that they will embrace the whole extent of western europe during the five centuries of revolutionary transition which have elapsed since the middle ages we have lost sight of the fact that in all fundamental questions the western nations form one political system it was under catholic feudalism that they were first united a union for which their incorporation into the roman empire had prepared them and which was finally organized by the incomparable genius of charmaine in spite of national differences embittered as they were afterwards by theological discord this great republic has in modern times shown intellectual and social growth both in the positive and negative direction to which other portions of the human race even in europe can show no parallel the rupture of catholicism and the decline of chivalry at first seriously impaired this feeling of relationship but it soon began to show itself again under new forms it rests now though the basis is inadequate upon the feeling of community in industrial development in aesthetic culture and in scientific discovery amidst the disorganized state of political affairs which have obviously been tending towards some radical change this similarity in civilization has produced a growing conviction that we are all participating in one and the same social movement a movement limited as yet to our own family of nations the first step in the great crisis was necessarily taken by the french nation because it was better prepared than any other it was there that the old order of things had been most thoroughly uprooted and that most had been done in working out the materials of the new but the strong sympathies which the outbreak of our revolution aroused in every part of western europe showed that our sister nations were only granting us the honourable post of danger in a movement in which all the nobler portion of humanity was to participate and this was the feeling proclaimed by the great republican assembly in the midst of their war of defence the military extravagances which followed and which form the distinguishing feature of the counter-revolution of course checked the feeling of union on both sides but so deeply was it rooted in all the antecedents of modern history that peace soon restored it to life in spite of the pertinacious efforts of all parties interested in maintaining a natural separation between france and other countries what greatly facilitates this tendency is the decline of every form of theology which removes the chief source of former disagreement during the last phase of the counter-revolution and still more during the long pause in the political movement which followed each member of the group entered upon a series of revolutionary efforts more or less resembling those of the central nation and our recent political changes cannot but strengthen this tendency though of course with nations less fully prepared the results of these efforts have at present been less important than in france meanwhile it is evident that this uniform condition of internal agitation gives increased security for peace by which its extension had been originally facilitated and thus although there is no organized international union as was the case in the middle ages yet the pacific habits and intellectual culture of modern life have already been sufficiently diffused to call out an instinct of fraternity stronger than any that has ever existed before it is strong enough to prevent the subject of social regeneration from being ever regarded as a merely national question and this is the point of view which displays the character of the second phase of the revolution in its truest light the first phase although in its results advantageous to the other nations was necessarily conducted as if peculiar to france 
because no other country was ripe for the original outbreak indeed french nationality was stimulated by the necessity of resisting the counter-revolutionary coalition but the final and constructive phase which has begun now that the national limits of the crisis have been reached should always be regarded as common to the whole of western europe for it consists essentially in spiritual reorganization and the need of this in one shape or other presses already with almost equal force upon each of the five nations who make up the great western family conversely the more occidental the character of the reforming movement the greater will be the prominence given to intellectual and moral regeneration as compared with mere modifications of government in which of course there must be very considerable national differences the first social need of western europe is community in belief and in habits of life and this must be based upon a uniform system of education controlled and applied by a spiritual power that shall be accepted by all this once satisfied the reconstruction of governments may be carried out in accordance with the special requirements of each nation difference in this respect is legitimate it will not affect the essential unity of the positivist republic which will be bound together by more complete and durable ties than the catholic republic of the middle ages not only then do we find from the whole condition of western europe that the movement of opinion transcends in importance all political agitation but we find that everything points to the necessity of establishing a spiritual power as the sole means of directing this free yet systematic reform of opinion and of life with the requisite consistency and largeness of view we now see that the old revolutionary prejudice of confounding temporal and spiritual power is directly antagonistic to social regeneration although it once aided the preparation for it in the first place it stimulates the sense of nationality which ought to be subordinate to larger feelings of international fraternity and at the same time with the view of satisfying the conditions of uniformity which are so obviously required for the solution of the common problem it induces efforts at forcible incorporation of all the nations into one efforts as dangerous as they are fruitless my work on positive philosophy contains a detailed historical explanation of what i mean by the expression western europe but the conception is one of such importance in relation to the questions of our time that i shall now proceed to enumerate and arrange in their order the elements of which this great family of nations consists since the fall of the roman empire and more especially from the time of charmaine france has always been the centre socially as well as geographically of this western region which may be called the nucleus of humanity on the one great occasion of united political action on the part of western europe that is in the crusades of the eleventh and twelfth century it was evidently france that took the initiative it is true that when the decomposition of catholicism began to assume a systematic form the centre of the movement for two centuries shifted its position it was germany that gave birth to the metaphysical principles of negation their first political application was in the dutch and english revolutions which incomplete as they were owing to insufficient intellectual preparation yet served as preludes to the great final crisis these preludes were most important as showing the real social tendency of the critical doctrines but it was reserved for france to coordinate these doctrines into a consistent system and to propagate them successfully france then resumed her position as the principal centre in which the great moral and political questions were to be worked out and this position she will in all probability retain as in fact it is only a recurrence to the normal organization of the western republic which had been temporarily modified to meet special conditions a fresh displacement of the centre of the social movement is not to be expected unless in a future too distant to engage our attention it can indeed only be the result of wide extension of our advanced civilization beyond european limits as will be explained in the conclusion of this work north and south of this natural centre we find two pairs of nations between which france will always form an intermediate link partly from her geographical position and also from her language and manners the first pair is for the most part protestant it comprises first the great germanic body with the numerous nations that may be regarded as its offshoots especially holland which 
since the middle ages has been in every respect the most advanced portion of germany secondly great britain with which may be classed the united states notwithstanding their present attitude of rivalry the second pair is exclusively catholic it consists of the great italian nationality which in spite of political divisions has always maintained its distinct character and of the population of the spanish peninsula for portugal sociologically considered is not to be separated from spain which has so largely increased the western family by its colonies to complete the conception of this group of advanced nations we must add two accessory members greece and poland countries which though situated in eastern europe are connected with the west the one by ancient history the other by modern beside these there are various intermediate nationalities which i need not now enumerate connecting or demarcating the more important branches of the family in this vast republic it is that the new philosophy is to find its sphere of intellectual and moral action it will endeavour so to modify the initiative of the central nation by the reacting influences of the other four as to give increased efficiency to the general movement it is a task eminently calculated to test the social capabilities of positivism and for which no other system is qualified the metaphysical spirit is as unfit for it as the theological the rupture of the medieval system is due to the decadence of theology but the direct agent in the rupture was the solvent force of the metaphysical spirit neither the one nor the other then is likely to recombine elements the separation of which is principally due to their own conceptions it is entirely to the spontaneous action of the positive spirit that we owe those new though insufficient links of union whether industrial artistic or scientific which since the close of the middle ages have been leading us more and more decidedly to a reconstruction of the western alliance and now that positivism has assumed its matured and systematic form its competence for the work is even more unquestionable it alone can effectually remove the national antipathies which still exist but it will do this without impairing the natural qualities of any of them its object is by a wise combination of these qualities to develop under a new form the feeling of a common occidentality end of section six section seven of a general view of positivism this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by greg oxnard a general view of positivism by auguste comte translated by john henry bridges chapter two the social aspect of positivism as shown by its connection with the general revolutionary movement of western europe part three by extending the social movement to its proper limits we thus exhibit on a larger scale the same features that were noticed when france alone was being considered abroad or at home every great social problem that arises proves that the object of the second revolutionary phase is a reorganization of principles and of life by this means a body of public opinion will be formed of sufficient force to lead gradually to the growth of new political institutions these will be adapted to the special requirements of each nation under the general superintendence of the spiritual power from whom our fundamental principles will have proceeded the general spirit of these principles is essentially historical whereas the tendency of the negative phase of the revolution was anti-historical without blind hatred of the past men would never have had sufficient energy to abandon the old system but henceforth the best evidence of having attained complete emancipation will be the rendering full justice to the past in all its phases this is the most characteristic feature of that relative spirit which distinguishes positivism the surest sign of superiority whether in persons or systems is fair appreciation of opponents and this must always be the tendency of social science when rightly understood since its provision of the future is avowedly based upon systematic examination of the past 
it is the only way in which the free and yet universal adoption of general principles of social reconstruction can ever be possible such reconstruction viewed by the light of sociology will be regarded as a necessary link in the series of human development and thus many confused and incoherent notions suggested by the arbitrary beliefs hitherto prevalent will finally disappear the growth of public opinion in this respect is aided by the increasing strength of social feeling both combine to encourage the historical spirit which distinguishes the second period of the revolution as we see indicated already in so many of the popular sympathies of the day acting on this principle positivists will always acknowledge the close relation between their own system and the memorable effort of medieval catholicism in offering for the acceptance of humanity a new organization of life we would not disassociate it with all that has gone before on the contrary it is our boast that we are but proposing for her maturity the accomplishment of the noble effort of her youth an effort made when intellectual and social conditions precluded the possibility of success we are too full of the future to fear any serious charge of retrogression towards the past it would be strange were such a charge to proceed from those of our opponents whose political ideal is that amalgamation of temporal and spiritual power which was adopted by the theocratic or military systems of antiquity the separation of these powers in the middle ages is the greatest advance ever yet made in the theory of social order it was imperfectly effected because the time was not ripe for it but enough was done to show the object of the separation and some of its principal results were partially arrived at it originated the fundamental doctrine of modern social life the subordination of politics to morals a doctrine which in spite of the most obstinate resistance has survived the decline of the religion which first proclaimed it we see it now sanctioned by a republican government which has shaken off the fetters of that religion more completely than any other a further result of the separation is the keen sense of personal honour combined with general fraternity which distinguishes western nations especially those who have been preserved from protestantism to the same source is due the general feeling that men should be judged by their intellectual and moral worth irrespectively of social position yet without upsetting that subordination of classes which is rendered necessary by the requirements of practical life and this has accustomed all classes to free discussion of moral and even of political questions since every one feels it a right and a duty to judge actions and persons by the general principles which a common system of education has inculcated alike on all i need not enlarge on the value of the medieval church in organizing the political system of western europe in which there was no other recognized principle of union all these social results are usually attributed to the excellence of the christian doctrine but history when fairly examined shows that the source from which they are principally derived is the catholic principle of separating the two powers for these effects are nowhere visible except in the countries where this separation has been effected although a similar code of morals and indeed a faith identically the same have been received elsewhere besides although sanctioned by the general tone of modern life they have been neutralized to a considerable extent by the decline of the catholic organization and this especially in the countries where the greatest efforts have been made to restore the doctrine to its original purity and power in these respects positivism has already appreciated catholicism more fully than any of its own defenders not even excepting de maistre himself as indeed some of the more candid organs of the retrograde school have allowed but the merit of catholicism does not merely depend on the fact that it forms a most important link in the series of human development what adds to the glory of its efforts is that as history clearly proves they were in advance of their time the political failure of catholicism resulted from the imperfection of its doctrines and the resistance of the social medium in which it worked it is true that monotheism is far more compatible with the separation of powers than polytheism but from the absolute character of every kind of theology there was always a tendency in the medieval system to degenerate into mere theocracy in fact the proximate cause of its decline was the increased development of this tendency in the fourteenth century 
and the resistance which it provoked among the kings who stood forward to represent the general voice of condemnation again though separation of powers was less difficult in the defensive system of medieval warfare than in the aggressive system of antiquity yet it is thoroughly repugnant to the military spirit in all its phases because adverse to that concentration of authority which is requisite in war and thus it was never thoroughly realized except in the conceptions of a few leading men among both the spiritual and temporal class its brief success was principally caused by a temporary combination of circumstances it was for the most part a condition of very unstable equilibrium oscillating between theocracy and empire but positive civilization will accomplish what in the middle ages could only be attempted we are aided not merely by the example of the middle ages but by the preparatory labours of the last five centuries new modes of thought have arisen and practical life has assumed new phases and all are alike tending towards the separation of powers what in the middle ages was but dimly foreseen by a few ardent and aspiring minds becomes now an inevitable and obvious result instinctively felt and formally recognized by all from the intellectual point of view it is nothing more than the distinction between theory and practice a distinction which is already admitted more or less formally throughout civilized europe in subjects of less importance which therefore it would be unreasonable to abandon in the most difficult of all arts and sciences viewed socially it implies the separation of education from action or of morals from politics and few would deny that the maintenance of this separation is one of the greatest blessings of our progressive civilization the distinction is of equal importance to morality and to liberty it is the only way of bringing opinion and conduct under the control of principle for the most obvious application of a principle has little weight when it is merely an act of obedience to a special command taking the more general question of bringing our political forces into harmony it seems clear that theoretical and practical power are so totally distinct in origin and operation whether in relation to the heart or intellect or character that the functions of counsel and of command ought never to belong to the same organs all attempts to unite them are at once retrograde and visionary and if successful would lead to the intolerable government of mediocrities equally unfit for either kind of power but as i shall show in the following chapters this principle of separation will soon find increasing support among women and the working classes the two elements of society in which we find the greatest amount of good sense and right feeling modern society is in fact already ripe for the adoption of this fundamental principle of polity and the opposition to it proceeds almost entirely from its connection with the doctrines of the medieval church which have now become deservedly obsolete but there will be an end of these revolutionary prejudices among all impartial observers as soon as the principle is seen embodied in positivism the only doctrine which is wholly disconnected with theology all human conceptions all social improvements originated under theological influence as we see proved clearly in many of the humblest details of life but this has never prevented humanity from finally appropriating to herself the results of the creeds which she has outgrown and so it will be with this great political principle it has already become obsolete except for the positive school which has verified inductively all the minor truths implied in it the only direct attacks against it come from the metaphysicians whose ambitious aspirations for absolute authority would be thwarted by it it is they who attempt to fasten on positivism the stigma of theocracy a strange and in most cases disingenuous reproach seeing that positivists are distinguished from their opponents by discarding all beliefs which supersede the necessity for discussion the fact is that serious disturbances will soon be caused by the pertinacious efforts of these adherents of pedantocracy to regulate by law what ought to be left to moral influences and then the public will become more alive to the necessity of the positivist doctrine of systematically separating political from moral government the latter should be understood to rely exclusively on the forces of conviction and persuasion its influence on action being simply that of counsel 
whereas the former employs direct compulsion based upon superiority of physical force we now understand what is meant by the constructive character of the second revolutionary phase it implies a union of the social aspirations of the middle ages with the wise political instincts of the convention in the interval of these two periods the more advanced nations were without any systematic organization and were abandoned to the twofold process of transition which was decomposing the old order and preparing the new both these preliminary steps are now sufficiently accomplished the desire for social regeneration has become too strong to be resisted and a philosophical system capable of directing it has already arisen we may therefore recommence on a better intellectual and social basis the great effort of catholicism to bring western europe to a social system of peaceful activity and intellectual culture in which thought and action should be subordinated to universal love reconstruction will begin at the points where demolition began previously the dissolution of the old organism began in the fourteenth century by the destruction of its international character conversely reorganization begins by satisfying the intellectual and mental wants common to the five western nations and here since the object of this character is to explain the social value of positivism i may show briefly that it leads necessarily to the formation of a definite system of universal morality this being the ultimate object of all philosophy and the starting point of all polity since it is by its moral code that every spiritual power must be principally tested this will be the best mode of judging of the relative merits of positivism and catholicism to the positivist the object of morals is to make our sympathetic instincts preponderate as far as possible over the selfish instincts social feelings over personal feelings this way of viewing the subject is peculiar to the new philosophy for no other system has included the more recent additions to the theory of human nature of which catholicism gave so imperfect a representation it is one of the first principles of biology that organic life always preponderates over animal life by this principle the sociologist explains the superior strength of the self-regarding instincts since these are all connected more or less closely with the instinct of self-preservation but although there is no evading this fact sociology shows that it is compatible with the existence of benevolent affections affections which catholicism had asserted to be altogether alien to our nature and to be entirely dependent on superhuman grace derived from a sphere beyond the reach of law the great problem then is to raise social feeling by artificial effort to the position which in the natural condition is held by selfish feeling the solution is to be found in another biological principle namely that functions and organs are developed by constant exercise and atrophied by prolonged inaction now the effect of the social state is that while our sympathetic instincts are constantly stimulated the selfish propensities are restricted since if free play were given to them human intercourse would very shortly become impossible thus it compensates to some extent the natural weakness of the sympathies that they are capable of almost indefinite extension while self-love meets inevitably with a more or less efficient check both these tendencies naturally increase with the progress of humanity and their increase is the best measure of the degree of perfection that we have attained their growth though spontaneous may be materially hastened by organized intervention both of individuals and of society the object being to increase all favourable influences and diminish the unfavourable this is the object of the art of morals like every other art it is restricted within certain limits but in this case the limits are less narrow because the phenomena being more complex are also more modifiable positive morality differs therefore from that of theological as well as of metaphysical systems its primary principle is the preponderance of social sympathy full and free expression of the benevolent emotions is made the first condition of individual and social well-being since these emotions are at once the sweetest to experience and are the only feelings which can find expression simultaneously in all the doctrine is as deep and pure as it is simple and true it is eminently characteristic of a philosophy which by virtue of its attribute of reality 
subordinates all scientific conceptions to the social point of view as the sole point from which they can be coordinated into a whole the intuitive methods of metaphysics could never advance with any consistency beyond the sphere of the individual theology especially christian theology could only rise to social conceptions by an indirect process forced upon it not by its principles but by its practical functions intrinsically its spirit was altogether personal the highest object placed before each individual was the attainment of his own salvation and all human affections were made subordinate to the love of god it is true that the first training of our higher feelings is due to theological systems but their moral value depended mainly on the wisdom of the priesthood they compensated the defects of their doctrine and at that time no better doctrine was available by taking advantage of the antagonism which naturally presented itself between the interests of the imaginary and those of the real world the moral value of positivism on the contrary is inherent in its doctrine and can be largely developed independently of any spiritual discipline though not so far as to dispense with the necessity for such discipline thus while morality as a science is made far more consistent by being placed in its true connection with the rest of our knowledge the sphere of natural morality is widened by bringing human life individually and collectively under the direct and continuous influence of social feeling i have stated that positive morality is brought into a coherent and systematic form by its principle of universal love this principle must now be examined first in its application to the separate aspects of the subject and subsequently as the means by which the various parts may be coordinated there are three successive states of morality answering to the three principal stages of human life the personal the domestic and the social stage the succession represents the gradual training of the sympathetic principle it is drawn out step by step by a series of affections which as it diminishes in intensity increases in dignity this series forms our best resource in attempting as far as possible to reach the normal state subordination of self-love to social feeling these are the two extremes in the scale of human affections but between them there is an intermediate degree namely domestic attachment and it is on this that the solution of the great moral problem depends the love of his family leads man out of his original state of self-love and enables him to attain finally a sufficient measure of social love every attempt on the part of the moral educator to call this last into immediate action regardless of the intermediate stage is to be condemned as utterly chimerical and profoundly injurious such attempts are regarded in the present day with far too favourable an eye far from being a sign of social progress they would if successful be an immense step backwards since the feeling which inspires them is one of perverted admiration for antiquity since the importance of domestic life is so great as a transition from selfish to social feeling a systematic view of its relations would be the best mode of explaining the spirit of positive morality which is in every respect based upon the order found in nature the first germ of social feeling is seen in the affection of the child for its parents filial love is the starting point of our moral education from it springs the instinct of continuity and consequently of reverence for our ancestors it is the first tie by which the new being feels himself bound to the whole past history of man brotherly love comes next implanting the instinct of solidarity that is to say of union with our contemporaries and thus we have already a sort of outline of social existence with maturity new phases of feeling are developed relationships are formed of an entirely voluntary nature which have therefore a still more social character than the involuntary ties of earlier years this second stage in moral education begins with conjugal affection the most important of all in which perfect fullness of devotion is secured by the reciprocity and indissolubility of the bond it is the highest type of all sympathetic instincts and has appropriated to itself in a special sense the name of love from this most perfect of unions proceeds the last in the series of domestic sympathies parental love 
it completes the training by which nature prepares us for universal sympathy for it teaches us to care for our successors and thus it binds us to the future as filial love had bound us to the past i place the voluntary class of domestic sympathies after the involuntary because it was the natural order of individual development and it thus bore out my statement of the necessity of family life as an intermediate stage between personal and social life but in treating more directly of the theory of the family as the constituent element of the body politic the inverse order should be followed in that case conjugal attachment would come first as being the feeling through which the family comes into existence as a new social unit which in many cases consists simply of the original pair domestic sympathy when once formed by marriage is perpetuated first by parental then by filial affection it may afterwards be developed by the tie of brotherhood the only relation by which different families can be brought into direct contact the order followed here is that of decrease in intensity and increase in extension the feeling of fraternity which i place last because it is usually least powerful will be seen to be of primary importance when regarded as the transition from domestic to social affections it is indeed the natural type to which all social sympathies conform but there is yet another intermediate relation without which this brief exposition of the theory of the family would be incomplete i mean the relation of household servitude which may be called indifferently domestic or social it is a relation which at the present time is not properly appreciated on account of our dislike to all subjection and yet the word domestic is enough to remind us that in every normal state of humanity it supplies what would otherwise be a want in household relations its value lies in completing the education of the social instinct by a special apprenticeship in obedience and command both being subordinated to the universal principle of mutual sympathy the object of the preceding remarks was to show the efficacy of the positive method in moral questions by applying it to the most important of all moral theories the theory of the family for more detailed proof i must refer to my treatise on positive polity to which this work is introductory i would call attention however to the beneficial influence of positivism on personal morality actions which hitherto had always been referred even by catholic philosophers to personal interests are now brought under the great principle of love on which the whole positive doctrine is based feelings are only to be developed by constant exercise and exercise is most necessary when the intrinsic energy of the feeling is least it is therefore quite contrary to the true spirit of moral education to degrade duty in questions of personal morality to a mere calculation of self-interest of course in this elementary part of ethics it is easier to estimate the consequences of actions and to show the personal utility of the rules enjoined but this method of procedure inevitably stimulates the self-regarding propensities which are already too preponderant and the exercise of which ought as far as possible to be discouraged besides it often results in practical failure to leave the decisions of such questions to the judgment of the individual is to give a formal sanction to all the natural differences in men's inclinations when the only motive urged is consideration for personal consequences every one feels himself to be the best judge of these and modifies the rule at his pleasure positivism guided by a truer estimate of the facts entirely remodels this elementary part of ethics its appeal is to social feeling and not to personal since the actions in question are of a kind in which the individual is far from being the only person interested for example such virtues as temperance and chastity are inculcated by the positivist on other grounds than those of their personal advantages he will not of course be blind to their individual value but this is an aspect on which he will not dwell too much for fear of concentrating attention on self-interest at all events he will never make it the basis of his precepts but will invariably rest them upon their social value there are cases in which men are preserved by an unusually strong constitution from the injurious effects of intemperance or libertinage but such men are bound to sobriety and continence as vigorously as the rest because without these virtues they cannot perform their social duties rightly even in the commonest of personal virtues cleanliness 
this alteration in the point of view may be made with advantage a simple sanitary regulation is thus ennobled by knowing that the object of it is to make each one of us more fit for the service of others in this way and in no other can moral education assume its true character at the very outset we shall become habituated to the feeling of subordination to humanity even in our smallest actions it is in these that we should be trained to gain the mastery over the lower propensities and the more so that in these simple cases it is less difficult to appreciate their consequences the influence of positivism on personal morality is in itself a proof of its superiority to other systems its superiority in domestic morality we have already seen and yet this was the best aspect of catholicism forming indeed the principal basis of its admirable moral code on social morality strictly so called i need not dwell at length here the value of the new philosophy will be more direct and obvious the fact of its standing at the social point of view being the very feature which distinguishes it from all other systems in defining the mutual duties arising from the various relations of life or again in giving solidity and extension to the instinct of our common fraternity neither theological nor metaphysical morality can bear comparison with positivism its precepts are adapted without difficulty to the special requirements of each case because they are ever in harmony with the general laws of society and of human nature but on these obvious characteristics of positivism i need not further enlarge as i shall have other occasions for referring to them End of section seven.